Amen. Well, we uh, want to pause for just uh, a minute and extend a warm welcome to our online viewers. We know we have a very strong online contingent of people that watch us via Facebook and or check us out later on our website. It's amazing and, it, and it's growing. And we're grateful you are with us. Welcome as we worship this morning, as we engage with a God who cares about the quality of our lives. This morning we are starting a brand new sermon series and we're in, encouraging people to wonder, are you invested in having a good life? Do you want God's help to have a good life? Well, stay tuned, because we're going to be talking about that today and for the next few weeks. God desires for us to have a life that is flourishing. Well, let us turn to the doxology, which in my mind is the high point of our worship service, because as we offer God a percentage of a part of our wealth, what we're symbolically doing in that act is not simply just giving money. We're also attesting to the reality that God sustains us every moment of the day. All we have is his, and we offer our whole selves to God. We could stand in the offering plate. That would be the image of what the, the offering truly is. We offer ourselves again to God in worship and in gratitude for all that he has done, on, done for us. We're on the heels of Easter, right? It feels weird that I really wanted Easter to last for a whole month. But he is risen, and we are grateful. So allow, allow me to pray for our, our offering. God, we give these gifts to you in gratitude for your many, many blessings. We give these gifts with hope as we hunger and thirst for righteousness, for your kingdom. May our offerings of money and time and energy be used to comfort those who mourn. Help us uh, to use these gifts. Use these gifts, Lord God, to extend mercy to others and to make peace. To help us all the more clearly see and participate in your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Please rise as we sing the doxology. standing for the reading of God's word. This scripture reading is taken from Matthew 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> I 
I know this question that I'm about to ask you is going to stretch some of your memories. I know that. But do you remember your first day of kindergarten? Anybody have some memories? We, and yes, so I learned today in Dent, people were looking at me like I was an alien, but that's not, nothing new there. Um, they didn't go to kindergarten, they went to first grade. So kindergarten, first grade, you have some memory of that. I remember kindergarten. Paul Newman kissed me in kindergarten. We had a kid named Paul Newman. I didn't tell them in Dent, I didn't think they were quite awake enough for that little... Well, school, you know, the, the kindergarten, first grade. Oh, and then I, and then, so my, my introduction just like got blown up. So then I was mentioning, do you remember getting on the bus? So, no, people walked. Did you walk? How many of you walked? Okay, geez. So I'm living in a different reality. Just go with it. So now just go with it because I can't rewrite it. You know, everything's new. Getting on the bus, getting off the bus. No, you didn't do that. Finding your room, having classmates, having a teacher, new clothes, new crayons, new workbooks. Is that? I'm not looking at you anymore. I'm just going to look at Connie. It was probably the first time, I'm guessing I'm right about this, it's probably the first time when you heard what it means. I don't like it that you guys are hiding and I can't see you. <laughs> when you heard what it meant to be a good student, what it meant to be a part of a classroom, a participating member of the classroom, what it meant to be in a good relationship with your teacher, probably the first time you started hearing some of that language. The teacher starts out the first day of every, pretty much every grade, setting some ground rules. You know, if you have 30 kids from 30 different families, you probably have 30 different ways that people think they can act in a classroom. And so the teacher has to spend some time clarifying, laying down the ground rules. They took time to explain, to clarify what it meant to be in their classroom, to be a good student. And the teacher, want, because, not because the teacher loved rules, but because the teacher loved learning. And they wanted you to have a positive, a really good experience learning and being a good student. We didn't realize at the time all of what they were doing when they were doing that work. But it still, I believe, impacts us to today as adults. Every year, year after year, they were building a foundation for us, and I believe that they still impact us. And here's a poem. I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Fulgham, but he wrote a poem that you might re recognize. All I really, really need to know I learned in kindergarten. Most of what I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sand pile in Sunday school. These are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. <laughs> the Dent women's bathroom has a sign that says, please flush before you leave. <laughs> I saw that this morning and was like, what? Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some, think some, and draw and paint and sing and dance. And play and work every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. <laughs> when you go out into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands. Stick together. Be aware of wonder. What a wise poem. Good guidelines. Good guidelines on how to live a good and happy 
and productive life. I just have to say this. Flip to the next screen. I just This is a little an aside, okay, and then we'll get back to the sermon. But these, one of my favorite rules was don't eat the glue or don't eat the paste. I was corrected this morning. Dent was a little snarky. I, I never understood why kids ate paste. Were you a glue eater? Were you a paste eater? Okay, thank you. Because there was like three or four of them. Sandra. So I can still picture. I, have, I don't have a lot of memories of grade school. Paul Newman kissed me. Got that one. And then, um, but I can still remember sitting across the table from Kyle who calmly and deliberately was eating paste across the table from me. And he was watching me as I was watching him as he was licking the paste off his fingers. I was equal parts fascinated and grossed out. And Kyle was not uncomfortable one bit. I don't, I don't understand. I never understood. Okay, so back, back, back to the sermon. But I needed to know who the paste eaters were in here so that I pick on you later or something. Um, so the first day of class, the teacher would carefully go through the guidelines. And when the teacher was done, sometimes they would post a list, something that would be like this, be respectful, be responsible. Because those are good. I mean, they never go out of style. And when the teacher was all done, sometimes they'd post it on the chalkboard for reference throughout the whole year. And later in life, we can see how some of these rules and guidelines seem to be pretty timeless. They're classic. They're good. Still, we do them as adults, hopefully. Stop eating paste. But All of what I have just explained is exactly what is happening in the scripture passage that we read this morning. Jesus is the teacher. His classroom Uh, is on a mountainside. He made his students climb a mountain. It's the first day of class with his first four disciples. He only has four at this point. Jesus is explaining how to be a good participant, a good student, in good relationship with others and with God in this brand new thing called the kingdom of God. Jesus was laying a foundation for all their future learning. He was casting a vision for the good life, the best life, an abundant life lived with God. And he also knows that his disciples have heard many things about what it means to be a student, to be a disciple, to be a follower. And the disciples think they already know what they need to know, mostly because... They're adults, but they they don't know what they need to know. Unfortunately, most of what they have learned about who God is and how to be in relationship with him and how to be in good relationship with others needs to be unlearned. Jesus is having to redefine what the good life really is. Jesus is upending and replacing their understanding with good news. And one commentary said, uh, and I love this, they said the Sermon on the Mount, which we're going to press into, the Sermon on the Mount is 100% good news. Not everything Jesus said felt like it was good news coming out of his mouth, but what we're going to be engaging with is 100% good news. It is good news, but it is also a major culture clash. When Jesus taught, he pointed out how the kingdom will upset their religious views. It will upset the values that the world has taught them. It was a startling teaching that we don't always get how much of a bombshell Jesus drops when he brings this teaching. It's different value systems clashing violently. Some some people actually call this a violent sermon 
because of the violent ramifications, the radical ramifications, if people start to believe the Sermon of the Mount and begin to live into the Sermon of the Mount, it changes the world. Kings and governments and people seeking power, they hate and hated the Sermon on the Mount. Differing values, like God will bless those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek. What? That is just plain crazy. This world is a dog-eat-dog world. It is survival of the fittest. I have been on the school playground. Might makes right. Or when Jesus says, God will bless and make happy those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. God will bless the merciful, those who extend mercy, and God will bless the peacemakers. Huh? What? Is the joke on us? Is God pulling our leg? Will he truly make us happy, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? Was God really telling us the truth that he said that you will be so full, so satisfied, that you will feel bloated? That's one of the definitions of the Greek word of being fulfilled. Will God utterly bless those who live by faith to a sense of overflowing? That can't be right. That can't be right. My brothers taught me to grab for the biggest pork chop, the biggest cookie, the biggest whatever. you grab. If you have two older brothers, you grab for food if you want to eat. We didn't pass the plate. We grabbed. And don't be a doormat. <laughs> Peacemaker, I grew up with John Wayne movies. I might not start the fight, but I sure will finish it. Right? Be careful. I don't want to be a disciple of John Wayne. What if the world has taught me things that I need to unlearn? It might not be a bad idea for us at some point to create our own list of things that, that we believe in as a church, maybe blow it up, put it on the wall, simply as a reminder that here we follow Jesus. Because I know I spent way more time in front of the television than with my Bible. I didn't grow up going to church. And when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount, I get it. You guys are listening to a sermon about a sermon. Really? Can't we just skip Matthew 5 through 7? Skip the Sermon on the Mount. Go to the places where we hear the stories of Jesus healing everyone. That is super cool. And then when he gets into arguments with his Jewish colleagues. That's kind of fun. Can't we just skip this? But the more I looked, the more I saw. Just as it is with all of Scripture. And it's doubtful that Jesus sat down and, and preached three chapters of Matthew in one sitting. <clears throat> Maybe, I mean, it's, it's possible, but one commentator said that, that if Jesus had done that, it's quite likely that the disciples' heads would have exploded because it's a lot of content. But maybe it would be helpful for us to remember what is going on in Jesus' life and ministry for him to go into the Sermon on the Mount. If you remember in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was driven into the wilderness after his baptism, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. No food, no water for 40 days. When he came out of the wilderness, the first thing he began to do was to preach about the kingdom of God and to heal all diseases. What happened when he did that was that people from all over the world heard about his free health care. They heard about that he could heal everything. And so people came hundreds by the droves. The crowds came and they, and they wanted to find Jesus. And so Jesus knew he needed to be specific. 
and clarify and explain very carefully what he was about and what this kingdom was about to explain his purpose and his mission. Jesus was building a new foundation and establishing a new kingdom, a new way of living, redefining what the good life looked like. He was doing something radically different. And the Sermon on the Mount is a good foundation for understanding for what Jesus is looking for from those who say they are his followers. We can't, and we can't simply assume that we have this foundation. It's kind of like freshman orientation in college. You know, I, I, I would interact with a lot of the seniors, right? The high school seniors. But they were too cool to admit they were going to freshman orientation. But then you get to the orientation and you found out they were too scared not to know what it meant to be a college student. I was never one of the cool kids, so I'm just saying for all of us, we do need this foundation. Jesus never tired of explaining what the kingdom is like. It was his main topic, and it's also weighty. The Sermon on the Mount is the beef. Do you remember the Wendy's television commercial? <laughs> They'd lift the big bun and have that tiny little patty, and then one woman would yell, where's the beef? We will be studying the beef together for the next few weeks. I don't know how long this is going to take us. <laughs> I'm being pulled along by this sermon series. I am not in control, but God is doing something. And so I don't know how many weeks we'll be on this, but we will be covering the basics of what it means to follow Christ, what it means to believe in God and be in relationship with others, to live in the kingdom, to live a good life. Where is the beef? What's the beef? It's the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Just a couple more foundational comments for us this morning. Would you please look at your bulletin and look at the text that we read this morning? And we, would you please identify if there was a word that was repeated maybe a few times? Could you just say that word out loud? Blessed. blessed. Yes. Okay, now here's another thing. Would you look at the text? Would you count how many blesseds there are in that passage? And just shout it out when you're ready. Nine. Nine. Yes. For some reason, I found 13. So I had to read that passage like five or six times because I knew it wasn't 13. Yeah. Nine sentences out of ten begin with the word blessed. That is pretty significant. The entire passage rests on this one word. Get this word right and the rest of the sermon falls into place. Get this word wrong and the whole sermon just kind of falls apart. Not my sermon, Jesus' sermon. The trick in defining this word is to see this word in the terms of those who were blessed and those who weren't. From a biblical perspective, not our perspective, a biblical perspective. Once we get that perspective, it puts the rest of the sermon in focus for us. It better sets us up to figure out how to achieve this quest of seeking the good life. This way of how to be happy in life, how to flourish, how to experience abundance in life. The abundance that Jesus wants us to experience. And I forgot this. I, I don't know. I forgot this. It was a surprise to me this week, and it continues to resonate as a surprise. So apparently I have a lot to learn. But God is always desiring that our relationship with him would be life-giving and good and satisfying and a blessing and that it would overflow in our lives and bless others. He desires that for us. And I forget that. I just kind of think about Christianity as rules. No, it's a relationship. Blessed are, that phrase, means, well, you are blessed. Happy are, as in happy are, or fortunate are, or you are rich, even. And that God's favor rests on those who fill in the blank from the Sermon on the Mount. It means you can trust that God is at work here, meeting people right where they are to bring about good for those who are experiencing these specific, specific difficult life circumstances and situations. 
As people are holding on to their faith, expecting God to do something that God meets them right there. And there are at least four major ways to understand this word blessed. And I will just share one of them this morning, three next week. The first, the one who is blessed is blessed personally and intentionally by the living God. It isn't an abstract blessing. It isn't an oops, an accident. It's personal, intentional, and specifically from God to you. I think that's pretty cool. That's an important thing to hold on to in understanding what that word means. God is blessing you specifically. Eyeball to eyeball. Reminding us that God is watching over our lives with care and compassion, evaluating, approving, blessing, or correcting, all so that we might live a life that is abundant and flourishing and thriving. So, you are invited. Jesus is issuing an invitation to us. Come up. Come up the mountainside. Sit down. Let me teach you. Let me teach you about God's heart and who God favors in this world because it's not necessarily who you think. We might hear some things that we don't know how to handle. They might be surprising. They might unsettle us, maybe in, in, in some good ways. Some things might surprise us. We might want to add a few of these principles, guidelines, these values, and we might want to jettison some others. Jesus is inviting us to climb, to make the climb. Come eager and hunger to, hungry to learn. That is the first step, and it's a real step. And God sees you making that step, and he will bless you. He will bless us. And we will be blessed as we stay on the mountain, as we realize that we could do even more in our spiritual growth, in becoming good students wrestling with the Holy Spirit, being stretched and transformed into people that are serving and blessing God and blessing others. And then it is up to us, ultimately, at some point. It is up to us. No one can make you do this. It is up to you. One day, you will have to decide, will you come down that mountain following Jesus? Because Jesus didn't stay on that mountaintop. He came down that mountain and he walked into the real world and he did and he continues to touch and heal lives and heal families and heal communities and heal nations and transform the world and he's inviting us to participate in that work to join him this will take courage, no doubt. But the effort will be worth it. After all, Jesus has promised us that we will be blessed. Please rise with me as we turn to our next hymn. Is it the next hymn? I, get, I got confused in Dent. Oh, I'm doing announcements. Please rise, and I'll tell you two short announcements. So go ahead and rise. For those of you who have a heart for the earth and preserving the earth, and you care about nature, and sometimes for some of us, nature is our church, I would like to encourage you to come if you'd like to and be a part of the dent ditch days, the cleanup days. It's Saturday, April 18th at 10.30. You meet at the UMC parking lot, and we'll clean up the garbage in the ditch. And also we end up telling a lot of fun stories. So Lynette and I had way more fun than we probably should have. Any two people should have had fun cleaning up garbage last year. And it's amazing what people throw away in the ditch. I mean, it's, so if you'd like to participate in that, more, the more the merrier. Maybe, you know, hopefully it'll be a beautiful day. Join us in that work. Anywhere you clean up garbage is a gift and a blessing. And then 10 days from now, I'd like to encourage you to participate in kayaking. 
Ever since I got here, I've been wanting to kayak your lakes, and this is the year, folks. This is the year I'm going to kayak like a crazy woman. I have extra kayaks. If you don't know how to kayak, I'll teach you how to kayak. I have helped people feel comfortable about kayaking. I haven't lost anyone. I haven't lost a single person. I've taught 50, 75 people. I've stopped counting to feel comfortable in a kayak and enjoy it as a hobby. So Wednesday, I don't remember. Check the news, the newsletter. Check the newsletter for information. All right, let us turn to My Faith Looks up to the verses 1 and 2. adult Bible study that's beginning here in Burgess. It's what, when does it start? 9.30. 9.30. It is entitled, So That the World May Know. And do you meet here in the fellowship hall or downstairs? Downstairs. So I just wanted you to be aware of that fellowshipping opportunity. And now as we uh, transition to our benediction uh, and to those who are online, uh, we pray that God's spirit will bless you through the technology but we are reminded now that as our worship service comes to an end, our service to the world just begins. And we are also reminded as we engage, as we are about to press into our traditional blessing, that the best blessing God could ever give us is more of himself. Just keep that in mind as you receive the blessing this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen and amen. Have a blessed Sunday. <laughs>